before we introduce our speakers, I just wanted um, just a couple of housekeeping issues. Um, please silence your cell phones. Anybody who needs listening devices, there are a few over on the table. And um, it is fall, and we have started our membership drive. And for those who are not members and would like to join, we do have membership forms on the table as well. And if you've already sent in your check, thank you very much. We appreciate your support and your help. So um, this is our first series in our first Friday forums. Uh, this morning, we will be hearing from David Kucharski and Carol Kowalski about the 2018 Comprehensive Plan. And we will also be hearing from Susan Barrett regarding the Tri-Town Efficiency and Regionalization Transit Study. David Kucharski is the Planning Director for the Town of Lexington, a position he has held since September 2018. Prior to that, he served as the Assistant Planning Director for three and a half years and as a staff planner for three and a half years. Before moving to the Commonwealth in 2010, David lived in New York City where he worked several, several years for an engineering firm as a senior planner as well as a project manager working for the New York City Department of City Planning. He currently lives in Marblehead with his wife and two children. David holds a BA in Environmental Science from Binghamton University and a master's degree in urban planning from Hunter College. Carol Kowalski is the assistant town manager for development, a position that the town created in 2015 to direct a consolidated department comprising building, planning, zoning, health, conservation, and economic development. Previously, Carol was director of planning and community development for Arlington town planner and director of community services for the town of Reading, senior planner for the town of Concord, and planner with the Metropolitan Area Planning Council in Boston. Carol holds a BA in the public interest in telecommunications policy from Clark University, and her MA degree in urban and environmental policy is from Tufts University. She is an International City Managers Association credentialed manager candidate, and she is certified by the American Institute of Certified Planners. And last but not least, Susan Barrett started in her role as transportation manager for the town of Lexington in late January of this year, 2018. In this role, she oversees the Express bus service, administers a taxi voucher program for seniors, manages the suburban bus program through the MBTA and related federal reporting, provides education and outreach on a range of transportation topics, and is coordinating the Tri-Town Transit Study in collaboration with the town's planning department and the towns of Bedford and Burlington. Originally, she is from Chicago and she moved to Lexington in 2014 after having lived in Portland, Oregon for 17 years. Portland was where Susan first became involved in transportation, and it is also where she met her husband from Acton, Massachusetts, on a public bus. <laughs> Susan's professional experience includes many years of working in affordable housing, human services, and teaching in the Urban Studies program at Portland State University. Her years of working in banking, bookkeeping, and accounting, she tries hard to forget about. And that is all that I have to say right now, so I will turn it over to, I presume, Carol. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm going to be brief so that you can hear from David and Susan, and also so that there'll be plenty of time for your questions. I want to talk a little bit about <coughs> what happens when you don't have a, an updated comprehensive plan, and then what changes when you do have an updated comprehensive plan. Yeah. Without a current comprehensive plan process, every change, every development proposal creates anxiety and can feel ad hoc, random, and uncoordinated. With an updated comprehensive plan and a broad public engagement process throughout, 
We gain a resultant sense of mutual purpose and general agreement on expectations for how a community's development will better meet its needs. I think you know that those needs can be conflicting or opposing. For example, new development versus open space. Through a comprehensive plan process, a community attempts to make tough choices in advance in its plan recommendations for future action steps. This is often referred to as the implementation table of the resulting comprehensive plan. The implementation table and the conclusions that support it telegraph to landowners, residents, developers, and businesses what Lexington has planned for itself. So you can imagine how without that process, without going through the engagement together to determine what do we have planned for ourselves to meet the needs of our current and future residents and property owners, we aren't sending any message to the market. We're not sending any message to future residents or to future businesses who might want to be here. But what happens when you have gone through that process and when you are communicating that, you see that you suddenly start getting proposals that seem to reflect what you said you wanted. Uh, when I first took my position in the town of Reading, they had just completed a comprehensive plan update before I arrived. And I was so impressed to hear members of the Board of Selectmen and the Planning Board and residents say, oh, well, we're doing that because it's in the comprehensive plan. And, oh, this has to go to town meeting because we said we would do this in the comprehensive plan. And it was, it, it was very kind of matter of fact and accepted. And this was actually incredibly gratifying to me because it, it's exactly what you hope will happen, that those tough choices will have been considered and you're not going to get to a level of detail in the comprehensive plan that resolves everything, but you identify where there's common ground, where there's general agreement, and then you recommend action steps for how do we get down into the weeds on each of these issues that we've identified and who's the responsible party and an implementation committee carries forward the realization of those action steps. So I also, uh, in the town of Arlington where I was working before I came here, uh, the town updated, actually it did its first ever comprehensive plan. Um, there were always a lot of good area plans for redevelopment in the town of Arlington, but there had never been a comprehensive plan as currently conceived in Mass General Law. So that was a big deal, and since leaving that position, it's been really amazing for me to see, wow, they're doing this and this. They're doing what they said they were going to do. Uh, but you can imagine without that, it's hard to know what how we should react when the market wants to develop in Lexington. And it's hard to know whether we should embrace any particular initiative. So I wanted to just um, give you that kind of general overview. And you're going to hear a lot more detail from David next. And I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you, Carol. Can everyone hear me? Good morning, thank you for having me. Um, so I'm gonna go over a few items and then I'm looking forward to your questions. Um, basically, I'm gonna cover why are we doing this now and obviously uh, Carol did touch on some of the reasons. Uh, I'll also be discussing who is helping to lead this effort. Um, the development of the particular components of the plan, what it is that we'll be focusing on and trying to identify as the town's goals and, and policies moving forward. Uh, as well as an overview of the process, what we've done today, what we're looking to do moving forward with an emphasis on the outreach piece of, of the update. So why now? Um, Lexington, as probably you all know, are seeing some demographic changes um, with this population, which is getting older. Um, it's predicted to be 30% uh, 
of individuals that are over the age of 65 by 2030, and the Asian population is projected to be at 22 to 25 uh, percent by that same time. Uh, we're also seeing uh, average home prices continue to increase. Um, much of this has to do with Lexington's uh, longstanding reputation for its quality public education that's attracting families uh, to the community. And these forces are obviously um, affecting the demand for the housing and about increasing the, the, the tax uh, base for the community. Um, and these are just some of the other reasons. But um, in addition, it's been quite some time since we've updated uh, the town's plan. The first plan was done in 1968. It was a long-range uh, comprehensive town and financial plan. Uh, the next one uh, wasn't done until 2002-2003. Uh, so definitely was time to uh, update it. So who is, who is leading this effort? Um, it is an important one, and because it involves developing a uh, long-term vision that'll help uh, define what the community's goals and priorities are and help guide decision-making uh, regarding the future physical uh, environment for the town. Uh, the elected body who's responsible is the planning board, and uh, they're over, their charge is to oversee its development and its eventual adoption. Um, after town meeting approved the funding to update the plan, one of the first things that was done was identify individuals who would sit on the Comprehensive Plan Advisory Committee. Uh, the CPAC is a group of individuals with diverse backgrounds who were appointed by the planning board to cover as broad a spectrum of the community as possible. And their essential charge is to help develop the plan and engage uh, various community stakeholders in gathering feedback in order to develop it. Um, in addition to having two planning board members sit as liaisons to the committee, we also have two liaisons from the Board of Selectmen, as well as the school committee. We're working closely with staff and with the consultants we're hiring to help us with outreach, draft the plan, and some of the specific details of the components that I'll be uh, discussing. What is the plan made up of? Mass General Law Section 81D, which authorizes a planning board to develop a plan, has identified these as the core elements, um, interrelated elements that should be addressed in a plan. While we were working to get the funding, many of the planning board members and members of the public were saying, could we look at other things? Does this really capture all the things that we're looking to address in this plan? So staff, working with the planning board, started to look at what other communities in the Commonwealth had done, as well as around the country. And one of the examples that we identified was something the American Planning Association had identified, which is something they developed standards for sustainable places, looking at livable built environments, harmony with nature, resilient economy, and interwoven equity, healthy community, and responsible regionalism. So we took a look at the traditional elements that are in the state law. And as you can see, there are certainly crossovers where certain elements meet with some of these other strategies identified. And working with the planning board and the CPAC, we identified these as the core plan components. And there's, certain, there's several elements associated with each of these. Obviously, as we move forward, we gather additional information. There will be some tweaks to this some things that we may not be capturing. This is just one example of the things that we'd be looking at as far as a livable community. Promotes and sustains a safe, clean, and attractive place to live, work, and play. Facilitates housing options to accommodate a diverse community. Provides safe and well-maintained public infrastructure and provides adequate and appropriate regulation of public-private development resources. Encourages sustainable development supported by reliable and affordable town services and supports and enhances neighborhood livability for all members of the community. So this is basically an overview of the process that we, what we've done so far. Staff working with the consultants are looking at existing conditions, data, and trends analysis. How have things changed in the community since the last comprehensive plan was done? We're working to identify those things, uh, putting together trend reports. We're in the process of scheduling several presentations that will be given uh, during CPAC meetings and if necessary as standalone public meetings that will be publicized. 
Um, we're also involved now and have been doing gathering public feedback in order to identify what the vision and goals are. And I'll be focusing on that in the next slide, what we've been doing. As we gather the information and we identify our existing conditions, essentially how we got to where we are today, we'll be developing reports and findings <coughs> which will help us develop the recommendations and the implementation steps that Carol referenced earlier. And eventually, the planning board will be looking to adopt it by 2020. As far as the public outreach process, as I said, we, we meet monthly with the Comprehensive Plan Advisory Committee. Those are publicly posted meetings. Earlier this year, we held a series of educational panels which focused on housing, economic, and transportation issues. The intent of these panels was to give audience members a sense of the issues and uh, challenges that not only on the communities are facing, but the region as a whole, to try to understand how we might be dealing with similar issues and how in some cases they might have been uh, dealing with them. We also are scheduling uh, World Cafe events. These are small, facilitated conversations. I believe some of you in the audience may have attended the first one, which was last Tuesday in September that occurred at Cary Hall. We have one scheduled for October 23rd in Estabrook, and then one in November 27th in the Community Center. Um, we're also holding a series of stakeholder interviews. Our consultant uh, will be reaching out to various town committees and organizations, uh, developers, um, property owners, to get their feedback. Uh, we've also reached out to various religious, cultural, and civic organizations. And we're also attending town events. I'd like to thank Susan for being at a lot of those events and trying to get the word out. We realize that in order for this to be a successful effort, we have to gather as much public input as possible because it, in the end, it, it is your plan. With that, I'll take questions and I'll please note that this is our website. You can go, if you already haven't, to learn more about the process. You can sign up to be notified about future events. You can view videos and presentations from past meetings. And please, if you already have it, you could RSVP for those small conversations uh, that I mentioned. Uh, they're specifically designed for small audiences. We have about three or four individuals to a table and um, encourage you to do that. If we find that they are popular, um, and we've had some positive feedback with the first one, we'd be looking to schedule them at different times of the day, uh, the week, and perhaps targeting specific audiences. So at this point, oh, sorry. Excuse me. Yeah. If, if everyone wouldn't mind, if we could just take questions at the end and just have everybody speak first and then we'll do the questions all together. Is that okay? Sure. Okay. All right. Thank you. So with that, I'll turn it over to Susan, who's working on the Tritown Transit Study. And a lot of the things that come out of that study will obviously be incorporated into the work that's going into the comprehensive plan. So we have been working closely with her and with the consultant that's been hired on that effort. cheating a little bit and I'm going to be using slides um, that were presented at our most recent public forum. It was our first public forum held in the same room on Saturday, September 22nd. But before I dive into this, um, just to kind of build off of what David said, so this um, transit study that we're doing is just a portion of what the comp plan is going to do in regards to transportation and then transportation is just one segment of the overall comprehensive plan. And how this kind of got out, sort of, I guess, a little ahead of things, it was just a matter of seizing upon an opportunity. So um, the state came out with um, a funding opportunity for efficiency and regionalization uh, projects. And the town applied for that, for this project, working with Bedford and Burlington. And, um, and how that was decided, because you know, we get questions, well, why Bedford and Burlington? And you know, does this apply to me if I work in Cambridge or Boston? And yes, it does. Um, but this decision to work with those two towns came about in a couple of ways. 
Um, one of which was that, um, I guess over the years, the you know town managers and staff of the three towns had talked about their various local transportation options. You know, we have Lex Express, Bedford has something called the BLT and the Dash, you know, Burlington has the B-Line and so forth. And they talked about how those things you know, maybe aren't really coordinated very well, they don't really connect, you know, ridership had been going down, costs had been going up, you know, there had to be a better way. And then another thing that happened over the past year was there was a study that was done, a transportation study actually by the Middlesex uh, 3 Coalition, looking specifically at the Route 3 corridor, where there's a lot of em employment. And, um, and out of that study came a number of recommendations that came out um, earlier this year, one of which was that the towns in the southernmost part of the Route 3 corridor, Bedford, Burlington, and Lexington, should get together and you know, look at their transportation services and see how they might better coordinate them. And then of course, yeah, the funding opportunity came about which allowed us to hire a consultant to work on this project. The project is actually moving along pretty quickly. It's intended to wrap up in December, um, and we have um, a few more public forums um, coming up. Sorry, I don't have the dates on the slide here, but we do have a poster right at the entryway. They're at the, actually, the library's been really gracious to host a couple posters for us and even some surveys, so those are upstairs as well. But I will tell you our next forum is on Monday, October 22nd. It's 7 p.m. in Cary Hall. And then our last set of public forums, where we'll actually be looking at some draft recommendations, will be on um, Thursday, November 29th. We'll have two of them that day, one at 2 p.m. at the Community Center, and then another one at 7 p.m. Um, back again at Cary Hall. So, um, so now I'll just kind of dive into kind of what we've, we've shared so far with, with the public. So when we had our first public forum, the first phase of the study is, um, is what had just been completed, which was the market analysis. So um, that's what this is about. So the little project background, I went into some of this. Um, so talking about really kind of how, um, you know, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of employment, but basically the um, population in our communities isn't super dense, but that changes during the day with employment. Um, we're served by a variety of services. So we're, we have MBTA service, we have their paratransit service, the ride, and then as I described before, we all have our own individual services as well. But one thing we hear is that there's a whole bunch of different needs. So we hear that a lot, and you can see some of these. Do you recognize any of these? Have any of you had these same concerns? So we hear a lot about wanting you know, better weekend service, um, I certainly hear about people wanting better connections to Alewife or just some better way to get into Cambridge or Boston. Um, so, but we have many challenges. You know, we have, there's needs of seniors, needs of students, needs of commuters, and then the cost of offering the services that everyone wants and constrained funding. So this right here is describing the project goals. So, um, obviously identifying the strengths and weaknesses of the systems throughout the three towns, um, and then reviewing the travel patterns, assessing the system efficiency, identifying unmet transit needs, and then um, some recommendations will be coming up. And again, looking at those draft recommendations is something we encourage you to come out and see um, with our last set of public forums at the end of November. Um, when we did our first public forum, the market analysis had just been done, and that's what these posters show, and I'll be showing them up on the screen. <coughs> so you can see what the consultant is trying to do. They're doing the market analysis, and then they're also looking at, you know, what's it showing us in terms of the ridership and, and the statistics, so what are the numbers saying, and what are the people saying? And we really do want to hear from the people, same way as you know, David and Carol expressed for the, um, for the comprehensive plan, we really want to hear from you. Um, we have a survey that is online. You can also complete it on paper. We prefer online if that's possible for you. Um, and if you go, we have the, the link, it's listed on the board, but it's lexingtonma.gov slash transit hyphen survey. You can take it online. And it's going to ask you questions about, you know, what are you, how are you currently getting around? And regardless of how you get around, whether you just, you know, drive everywhere, or maybe you use a combination of services like the MBTA, um, and maybe some local services, or you walk or bike, we want to hear from you. 
And you don't have to just be traveling within those, the three communities of Lexington, Bedford, and Burlington. Wherever your commutes take you, we would like to hear from you. <coughs> so you, you can look here on, on the screen, and later if you want to get a closer look, we have these blown up on the posters. So as part of the market analysis, here's what's been looked at so far is the tra transit potential. So, um, and as you can see, you know, transit service is generally more efficient when you have large concentrations of people, you know, for housing and employment. And so that's what this is showing you. This is um, blown up on Lexington, but these same sort of slides were developed for um, Bedford and Burlington as well. And then this next one is looking at the transit needs. So knowing that there's certain um, subgroups of the population that rely on transportation services usually more than others. So low-income people, youth, young adults, seniors, low-income households, zero, ho zero vehicle households. <coughs> and then these are the non-work trip destinations. So looking at those places that people want to get to beside work. So the restaurants, the retail, um, education places, government um, centers, healthcare. We hear healthcare is a very big one. We know a lot of our folks want to get to Leahy Burlington. And, and then of course we have parents telling us their kids need to get to a variety of places after school. So in addition to all the places that you know commuters want to get as well. Um, when we had the uh, public forum, on September, we also looked a little bit more closely um, in Lexington at what we currently offer for our local service. Excuse me. <coughs> My family's been dealing with a cold. <coughs> so how many of you are familiar with Lexpress? And have ridden it? Okay, so you know it's a fixed route service. It's currently at six routes, three buses, um, operating each day. And it's a, it's a loop structure. So everything kind of travels in a loop, and each loop um, is about, every, runs about every 30 minutes, takes about 30 minutes to run through the whole loop and each route going about every hour. And, um, and ridership has gone down over the years and there's been a variety of service changes over the years as well. So this average daily ridership is based on routes. So we have you know anywhere from like 250 to 320 or so people a day riding Lexpress. Oh, thank you so much, I really appreciate it. And how many of you are familiar with the LexConnect taxi service? Okay, great. So this is a program for seniors, 60 and up, and for people um, with disabilities who might be younger than that. And it is a, a very low-tech <laughs> service. It's a, it's a paper-based service where you can apply, they can come in and get vouchers um, <coughs> that will um, offer them a discount on taxi rides. And we partner currently with Checker Cab of Woburn that will provide them a door-to-door -door service. So you have to schedule those rides a day in advance, and, um, and, and seniors can get up to 12, or people with disabilities can get up to 12 vouchers a month. Each voucher costs $5 and goes towards the cost of the rides. And so you can see some of the common places um, that people are traveling to in these slides. So Burlington and Waltham being very common places. Oh, and I should point out down here, can you hear my voice if I step away? Okay. Down here, this is showing kind of the hot spots that we're, we've currently seen with where people are going via that door-to-door -door service. Would you just mention what four are you? Yeah, so over here, um, they, so let's stop and shop <laughs> is a common one. Um, the community center, um, this, is, this is interesting. This is over in the Peacock Farm area. So this is based on um, you know, some residents that live there and commonly go. Brookhaven is another one, so a lot of the seniors at Brookhaven are traveling on this service. And Leahy Clinic, as I pointed out before, um, this is a common place that, that le people like to get to. And these types of, um, this type of a breakdown based on a community was also done in Bedford and Burlington. So they've been holding their own public forums as well. And as described earlier, we also have MBTA service. How many of you have ridden the 62 or the 76 or our combined Saturday service? Yeah. Um, anyone familiar with the ride? Haven't taken that? Okay. So we have access to, to all of that. So this is 
This is looking at the MBTA service as well. So we will be taking a look at the MBTA service. And one of the things that's not listed on these slides is the REV ridership. Are you familiar with the REV? It's operated by the 128 Business Council. It offers an express service to Alewife um, and back for um, Lexington residents along with the various businesses that they serve. So our consultant will also be taking a look at that ridership as well. As I mentioned, we do have this survey online. Um, we encourage you to take it. Um, if you wanna just get it done before you leave today, you can also take it on paper and we have volunteers that enter those online for us, but if you can take it online, that's great. Shouldn't take you too long. And, um, and then I'm just gonna click through these. So what we did in the last one is um, our consultant kinda asked people very specifically what's working for you or not with our local services. But one of the things I want to add on to that, though, is that it's not just about those local services. This isn't just about Lexpress and LexConnect. We really want to look holistically. You know, so um, it might be about MBTA service. It might be about providing better connections to the MBTA service. It might be about, you know, I hear from people that just want a better way to get into Boston. You know, so, um, so we want to hear from that. People have asked me, I know one of the frequently asked questions we get is like, well, is this for me or is this, you know, for my students? So yesterday we were at the back to school nights letting families know, you know, about both the comp plan and the transit study, in addition to providing, you know, the resources, you know, some of the kids take Lexpress after school. We want them to know, no, the transit study is for anyone in your household who's traveling independently. So. Sure, if you're you know, middle or high school students traveling independently, we'd love to hear from them. It's a great way for them to participate in our democracy and share their voice. But you, as a commuter, we wanna hear from you as well. We wanna hear from our seniors, we wanna hear from people with disabilities, we wanna hear from everybody. So, um, so we hope you will take the survey, if you haven't yet, and come on out for a public forum. And if you could please um, be an ambassador as well and you know, share with your neighbors um, that these things are going on, that would be wonderful. Thank you. So now we can um, take questions. And uh, if you would, speak through the mic, please. Sure, Beth Sager. Um, so I have a kind of a background question. You said the last comprehensive plan was done in 2002. Are we still following it? And do we think it's going to change drastically what, what our new plan looks like? And then following up, how often are we supposed to actually have these plans in place? What's, what's the guideline for that? Typically, typically the guideline is to do some type of update every five years. So um, a lot of the things in the last plan, uh, some of the implementation measures that were identified have gone through, others have not. Um, I'd say, are we following it perfectly? No, um, but again, I think as Carol indicated, it, it's not supposed to address everything. You can't foresee every change that could possibly happen. So that's a reason why we are doing it. And I think we're looking to try to do it in a different format than the last plan was because there has been some evolution in what, what are the things, what are the components that a uh, community should be focusing on. Thank you. Can you just state your name, please? Thank you. Hi, George Vernell, uh, North Lexington and a member of the Economic Development Committee. Um, to follow on that particular comment, uh, one of the things that came out of the earlier planning, I'm not sure it was part of the comprehensive plan itself, but out of that was the identification of the best type of commercial development for the community, the best return. We have a limited amount of land, so they came up with the best opportunities, which was in 
uh, <coughs> biotech, and we've turned out to be the number two, number three now provider in the state. And it's, it was spot on and very helpful for the community. So that's the kind of thing that can come out of it. Uh, <coughs> but the difficulty, one of the difficulties, uh, with strategic planning is that too much time is spent on the nuances and the details and the plan itself rather than on the vision. And I think that the, the really important part is getting the vision right on what kind of a community we want. We can figure out how to maintain that only if we get the right vision uh, my example that would be uh, you can build a highway to you build a highway to Worcester, but it doesn't do you any good if you really want to go to Nashua. So uh, uh, what in the planning you're doing, what what is uh, I commend you for the amount of outreach you're doing, which I think is wonderful. But what is the focus? in terms of the vision? I think a lot of that will have to come from the, the, the feedback we're getting from the community. I think the, the components that we've developed, um, we're using that sort of as our guide for what we're hearing back. That's why we're putting such an emphasis on trying to gather as much public feedback as possible. The feedback we're getting, the the goals that we're hearing people identify, what the what they want to see achieved, um, we then have to look at that with this with the planning board and with the CPAC to see where there might be conflicts with um, and trade-offs with some, achieving some of those goals um, and, and the interrelatedness between some of those. You you want um, economic development? Does that bring additional traffic to the community? So these are the things that we're going to have to be uh, wrestling with um, with this vision as as we move forward. Don McKenna, um, and I agree with a lot of what George just said about the visioning piece, and I think um, just history learned from 2002, I, I also commend the amount of research, uh, outreach that you're doing, because I think what happens in these plans, as I've observed them over the years, is that not enough people participate, and you end up with a vision that is not necessarily supported by the officials that have to uh, make implement those changes. Um, so I just wanted to state all that. But I also wanted to ask you, um, as you mentioned earlier, you had those forums in which they were topic specific. Um, I'm wondering if you're planning on doing them again, because I think many of the people that I talked to who were part of those expected to come to be able to give specific feedback on those topics and were in some ways disappointed that it was mainly people telling us um, what was out there. And so I do think there would be some value um, in, in doing that, um, which I hope to see. And then my other question is um, that given that the selectmen put so much emphasis and the town has voted so much money to support the economic development of tourism, what, where are you going to go and how are you going to determine the part of the comprehensive plan that talks about tourism? And it does affect things like transportation. It's a huge problem that there's no Sunday service out to Lexington. Um, and we have some various ideas on that. And, so those are sort of my two basic questions. Thank you. Uh, we absolutely will have, we have to, it's imperative that we have opportunities for Lexington residents and property owners to provide feedback on not only those three subjects of the uh, education panels from earlier this year, which were housing, transportation, and economic development, uh, but we are now at the part of the process where we are with the Comprehensive Plan Advisory Committee and the liaisons determining which theme areas we will now provide 
pertinent data, on which we will provide pertinent data, and then identify issues and seek input. So, for example, they will certainly be, again, housing, transportation, and economic development, but also historic resources. Uh, and within economic development is tourism. That's, that's recognized as a very important part of Lexington's uh, planning landscape. So that's, that's absolutely within the draft themes that the, the committee will now uh, receive data with the community and, and also decide, are we looking at the right data points? Are we missing anything? And if we are, where can we get that information? Not just on what the trends of the last few years since the prior comp plan, but also projections, demographic projections, because that's what we're, the plan is for. It's, it's not for us at this moment necessarily. It's for who Lexington's going to be in the interval that this plan will, will uh, address. So yes on tourism and yes on the opportunity to provide input. Thank you. I, I just wanted to add one more thing that I forgot to mention. Um, I appreciate the um, smaller group sessions that you're having, but just from the general public, when you put out something that says you have to RSVP, that can be a barrier for people. And I know you don't get that many people coming to those things, so you might want to drop that RSVP from that because it makes people feel like it's exclusive. And as I'm sitting in this room, it's mostly people who are part of the process already. And I think we want the people that aren't. Yes, I, I recognize that. We did have to wrestle with that. The, uh, the, there was a functional and practical reason why we had to um, put an RSVP because if there's a number beyond what will be accommodated at the tables, there's no way for them to participate because of the uh, format of rotating among the small. And you have to keep the tables small so that everyone can hear each other and communicate. Uh, we have tried it with larger tables. It's a din. And you can't really hear each other. And that can be very off-putting and it inhibits participation. You might go and just try to listen and not try to talk so much or, or it can allow one person to dominate and so we don't want that. We'll consider not having RSVP and these first three are not likely to be the last and only of this type of engagement. So we'll see how we get, what kind of participation we get and if we just don't get an overwhelming number at each, we won't need to have the RSVP. Yeah, and who's participating is important, because you want broader people. I, no, I'd say at that September event last week, um, we had 40 people attend. And for me, I saw a lot of people I did not recognize, which I thought was a good thing. There were familiar faces, but there were also individuals I had not seen before. So in my opinion, that, that was a good thing. We're, we're, I think we're, trying, we're reaching, but we obviously have to do more. Um, Elizabeth DeMille Barnett. Um, I'm also from North Lexington. Um, louder? Okay. Um, I'm also from North, uh, North Lexington. Um, I have one observation and a question. And the first observation is that when we talk about housing demand and housing prices, um, there's another function. If you look at it as a formula, F is a function of what? And that's um, Lexington's tradition and commitment to diversity. Somebody who's married to a minority, um, we made, there are lots of school systems in New England that are excellent. Um, but our, what was the deal maker for us was that minorities could participate in the school system and we're welcome here. Which is not to say we can't do more, we've got our work cut ahead of us. But I think there's a larger regional problem. And if you were to talk to most minorities, you know, they will, Exper you know, they will share experiences with discrimination in other communities or things that they've heard about. And so I think when we think about master plans, regionalism is important. And I think we need to, you know, raise awareness with our neighbors um, that, you know, one of the reasons we have demand is because we are welcoming. Which, and as I said, I think we, we still have more work to do in that area, but we're a bit ahead of some of the other communities. The two questions I have are, the first one is, have you considered um, sitting down with the abutters to your revenue generating 
areas, such as Hartwell Avenue and Hayden Avenue. I think it would be really helpful to talk to people if you're looking at those as future sources of revenue or you have plans for them, to sit down with those communities and talk about how things are going now. And my second question is, in the transportation study, um, living in North Lexington, we have seen with ways in um, uh, Google a, a huge increase in traffic as the congestion built up in 128 Route 3. They're coming through our neighborhood. And are you looking at that? Um, streets that previously were residential are seeing bumper to bumper traffic at uh, rush hour. Thank you. Oh, thank you for your, your comments and questions. So, um, so a couple of things. So in regards to just you know the traffic congestion, so we hope that we can enhance transportation services and provide some better options for people. In um, North Lexington, there's not, at this point, some really great options. A lot of those folks, even if they want to take transportation, public transportation, they have to likely come into the center to be able to do that. Um, so hopefully through this, we, we you know, can come up with some, some better ideas and, and also work with our partners, um, our regional partners as well, um, to do that. Um, I've learned though that nothing really seems to happen super quick, um, but with, so I don't want to make promises that this is going to happen come July 1, um, but do know that um, even if you don't see changes right away, we are listening to people and, and working towards changes. Um, and then um, in terms of the specific traffic congestion, so this transit study is, it is looking at traffic patterns and where people are going and so forth, but in terms of specifically addressing like the people coming down your street because they're using ways or whatever, no, but that's why we mentioned that this transit study is just part of the overall work that's going to happen with um, the transportation element of the comprehensive plan. And so do you want to add anything more on that? Um, so yes, looking at um, how we calm traffic as it travels through communities is something um, the town has been doing. We, we have a traffic calming policy today. I think part of this would be revisiting that to see if how effective or not effective it's been. Look at other measures that we could possibly take to um, preclude traffic on certain roadways or um, reduce the speeds as w at, at which they're traveling. Uh, we've tried to make some um, effort on those fronts. As far as reaching out, Street wanted to do that. Who should they contact? Me. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. There's the transportation safety group. Um, it's made up of planning, police, uh, engineering, and the schools. And we also have liaisons from the bike committee, safe routes to school, uh, the transportation advisory committee, and the transportation services. Uh, Susan and I uh, serve on that working group, and we take in um, transportation safety requests. Um, regarding reaching out to abutters to the communities. Um, we have been uh, doing that. Uh, I know our economic development director, when there were some meetings regarding the Hartwell initiative that you may have heard of, there was some outreach there. One of the reasons we're having the uh, World Cafe small group conversation in Estabrook is to try to attract some of the residents that live in the Turning Mill uh, area. Uh, so we have been doing that and uh, we're looking to do more of that. Is it on? Yeah. Uh, Wendy Mans. Um, I uh, was pleased to hear that, that the transportation uh, planning that's going on appears to be uh, embedded in regional transportation planning, which seems to make sense. And listening to you recite all the various options of public transportation that are available, I mean, there's a huge coordination issue, obviously. And I read recently in the Globe that, uh, with regard to the Boston Public Schools, that when they had attempted, as it happens unsuccessfully, to change the start times for the school, they had made use of uh, a couple of MIT wunderkinds who worked out a wonderful algorithm as to what the most efficient use of the buses, uh, getting all the kids to the various schools and, and uh, dealing with the equities of transportation and so on because they were able, by using computers, to crunch an enormous amount of data and come up with a with a proposal, and in that case, the proposal didn't fly. But my question after all that is, uh, particularly if state funds are available for this planning, 
are you able to make use of that kind of analysis to try to coordinate all the various kinds of transportation that are available and the different needs? Oh, sure, so we will, we will be looking at um, all the resources that are out there and how we might be able to make the best use of them. Um, so we aren't just looking at how can we tweak, you know, for Lexington, how can we tweak LexConnect, how can we tweak Lexpress, we're really looking at everything and then seeing how can we make the best use of the resources and be as you know efficient as possible while enhancing the services. And in regards to, since you mentioned the schools, um, I'm gonna answer, I don't know if this is quite getting at your question, but um, one of the questions we've gotten a lot is, um, well, will you look at public transportation as a way to transport some of the high school students maybe, because the schools are considering changing the school start time, so that comes up a lot. So just hot off the press and on our website, we put up an FAQ and, um, and had the schools take a look at uh, how, how uh, we're responding to this. Um, and basically, we do have you know Dr. Julie Hackett, um, Peter Rowe, who's in finance and administration from the schools, and also Eileen Jay um, from the school committee serving on a group of stakeholders for the transportation study. And what, we, um, and what we're doing while solving the, the school transportation problem was not a key focus of the transit study. We also completely um, respect the fact that we want to look at all the resources and that you know, students are commuters as well. Um, so if there's a way to coordinate you know, we will, and provide better service, we will do that. Again, it wasn't the specific focus of the study, but you know, if there's opportunities for coordination, we will do that. So, does that answer? And, and do you have access to the kind of data-heavy analysis that, that they refer to? In the, I mean, I, I'm interested in the school transportation, but I, I just use that as an example. I mean, do you have any, possibly through state funds, access to this sophisticated sort of Oh, so, well, actually, so the other thing, the data have announced that they did for their school buses and getting the most efficiency. So another thing that just happened is the, um, with Dr. Hackett coming on board, is the schools have now hired a transportation consultant as well to really look at getting, um, seeing about the efficiencies with their school buses. So as best as possible, you know, try and work together. So. Um, I, I can't so answer that, that specifically, but we can follow up on that. Yeah. Issues. Yeah. Was there anything you wanted to add to that? Okay. Thank you. Hi, uh, Margaret Copey. Uh, a question and a com or a co couple of comments actually. Uh, one is about transportation. Would it be possible to incorporate data from fish into the transportation? survey uh, fish is the volunteer program that transports people to medical appointments i know it's not it's a private organization but even if you just incorporated the how many people they drive a month for example i think would inform uh, one of those slides you had up there about where about the taxi i was thinking it sort of goes along with that uh, the other thing was i wanted to comment on that in terms of all this development going back to the 68 plan and then the 2002 plan is the role of um, town meeting in rezoning and it seems to me that we have wonderful ideas we put all these things out there things go to town meeting and get voted down because of the two-thirds vote that's required which in terms of all the planning you're doing is fine but to implement usually is going to require that. So I'm, I don't know how to address that. I think that's a problem. I know that there's a, isn't there a proposal from the state about changing rezonings to 50% now instead of two thirds? There is perpetually a proposal yeah. every year, every legislative session to reform zoning and there's always an element of hoping to reduce the supermajority that's required for zoning. That supermajority was put into place for towns, not cities a long time ago because there was a sense that the towns wouldn't have the expertise to really know what they're doing with their, I mean, editorializing a little too much, but uh, it is difficult to get that two thirds vote. Uh, a comprehensive plan usually gives town meeting members and the whole community a little more confidence in their direction and it can make that two thirds easier to get if, if there's uh, good preparation on implementing those zoning bylaw amendments. Uh, and so yes, a lot of the implementation steps would, re the resulting implementation steps would be rezonings. 
Thank you for your question about FISH. FISH is an amazing resource for our community in terms of providing volunteer rides for, um, for people who need to get to medical appointments and a great community builder when you have neighbors, um, driving neighbors. So we um, have Janice Kennedy, if you might be familiar with her, um, who's part of FISH and Friends of the Council on Aging, um, participated in our stakeholder session. Um, in terms of getting actual hard data from them, um, we can definitely ask them about that. I mean, it's participating in the stakeholder meetings. You know, that's one of the things we hope for. We haven't asked them to turn over specific data, um, but you know, I will talk with our consultants and see about doing that. I know just kind of those basic like healthcare places are certainly showing up as um, as common places people want to get to. Um, and then the other thing I will say though is that one of the things, and it didn't show up in the slides, but one of the things that the consultants have done is also just taking a look at all the transportation services that are out there, of which many of them aren't even listed you know, in the slides that I showed you, because there's also a lot of private services as well. There's many private shuttles that are going about. There's some um, you know, senior daycare programs that have shuttles. There's even some larger com apartment complexes that have their own shuttles as well. So that is on a list of inventoried um, services that are available. Thank you for your question. I'm, I'm Ed Gantcher, I'm a, uh, a long time resident. I've lived here since I was in diapers and I've been seeing these planning process immemorial and to me they sound like they're coming across as just feel good meetings or something, they don't have any teeth in it. And uh, one of the problems I see is the, the, the MBTA, they should be a solution, but I think they are, they're the problem because of this central type of planning so it's for Boston's benefit, uh, for Boston's re uh, residents, uh, employers getting in and out, where uh, all the people that I've worked with, they live outside and they come in uh, to the local suburbs. And so I'm looking at this Tritown thing. I should really include Woburn and uh, Waltham. And uh, then it's all this duplication of uh, services. I see it, you just talked about it, all those uh, apartment shuttles, employer shuttles, yada, yada, yada. And it's, it's somehow we should really break off from the T and form a regional transit authority. So these, these towns, all the planning and the power would be in the city hall saying this is where we want our transportation, this is where we want our buses go and, and uh, take that away from Ten Park Plaza. Is there any way that you can, uh, uh, any legislation, uh, maybe some workarounds to the T to get things done? So, um, so we work with, uh, with the, t can you hear me? Yeah. Does it sound? Okay, so we do work with the MBTA, um, one because we give them money and they also give us money, so there's that relationship there. And also because um, you know their service runs through our community and many of our residents re rely on them. Um, so we do work with them. We also serve on the MBTA Advisory Committee, so that's usually me going to meetings. So if you have any particular things you want to send to me, you can, and also the public is welcome to attend those as well. Um, and in terms of, you know, why aren't we working with Woburn and Waltham? I mean, we're hearing that, you know, in terms of people saying, well, really, I need a better way to get to Waltham, or I need a better way to get to the Woburn Transportation Center, you know, or wherever, wherever you're going. You know, some people might be trying to get to Framingham. I had a person say, well, I have to get to Gardner. Gardner's really far away, and it involves taking the commuter rail and, you know, multiple connections. And, you know, and people going to Belmont, we have someone who comes routinely to the community center from, um, for Bel from Belmont, and um, he has to go into Alewife and, you know, in order to make the connections between our two towns. So, anyways, um, it's not stopping here. Yeah. Um, you know, this is a start. You have to start somewhere. Um, so that's what we're doing. doing. And, again, this work is just a tiny portion of what's going to happen with the transportation planning. And it's always an ongoing process. Things evolve. The T is evolving. There's gonna, you're going to start to see lots of changes going on with the MBTA. Feeling like this keeps shutting off, um, <laughs> and um, and the MBTA is also doing s something called the Better Bus Project. So they're really analyzing their bus service as well. So um, so 
it's an ongoing process. And, and we are open to all sorts of things. The thought of a regional transportation, um, you know, starting our own RTA, you know, that has come up, you know, if we get to that point or not. I mean, really, we need to hear from folks um, and just know that this is a start. And it's not meant to be just something that goes on a shelf, but something we'll actually take action on. In fact, the timing of the transit study was such that we wanted it to wrap up in December. So that if there were any changes that we could possibly make um, that would could happen in our next fiscal year, they could get into the budget that would then get you know approved in, um, in the spring. Well, I can say one little tidbit. I worked for a while up in one, one little tidbit. I worked up in Hatwell Ave uh, for about a year and a half, and <laughs> end up using a bikeway each day, each each day because that, that worked for me. But all of my coworkers were like millennials, and uh, they they would be uh, I think they'd be in uh, uh, I think they lived in uh, Brighton the area some of them and a lot of them Needham and Reading and. There was there was actually a way for them to get in. They tell them to try it, and then they try it, and they I think it all goes down to like the the, the rev shuttle or something that they, they these, these kids are bright. They look up and research it, and they say, well, we're not sure if that shuttle is going to be around in six months or a year funding. So I don't, I'm not going to risk things. As I already I already chosen the car that that displaced transit for me, and. Uh, but the thing is that the company had s so much turnover that they, they, they start to fold up. So the, the, the issue I see is some sort of a stability to the system. And fortunately, Lexpress is, but they need to connect with the other communities versus just localism. Uh, just to, to add on, so again, don't think of this as just being like, what are we going to do about Lexpress? This is, we really want to look at connections to other services. And the other thing I just wanted to re-stress is that, you mentioned, you know, these young people coming in from Brighton or, or Reading or wherever. Um, so we want people who live and or work in um, Lexington or visit Lexington on a regular basis or Bedford or Burlington to take the survey, provide their feedback, come out to the forums if they can. We really want to hear from them. So even those young people from Brighton, you know, we, we want to hear from them as a part of this process. Um, my question is a, a little bit more local on the transportation. So I can appreciate that we had the money to look at this regionalization, but um, when you look at the map of just Lexington, we are not all connected in Lexington. And as you pointed out, I mean, I live in North Lexington, so we have no access to public transportation unless we walk down a road with no sidewalks that, well, you know the road, um, to, to, to Lex Express. And I'm wondering, you know, are we overlooking something much more local, which is our whole town isn't connected. We have all of these items and they're taking people in all places, but we as a community, you have a lot of gaps. And is that being addressed first? Yes. yes, well, absolutely. That's definitely a key part of it. And so, and even with the Lex Connect, you know, um, so we want to hear from people what they need. And I can tell you that we hear, we are hearing, you know, both in phone calls and then, you know, what's coming up in the surveys from people that say, well, I just don't have any service on my street. Or people saying, you know, I, you know, I can't walk that far to get to a bus. Um, and you know, folks that just want to get to the community center, or you know, families that just want their kid to be able to get home after school, but you know, they can't right now because the bus is every hour. So if their child misses that bus, how are they going to get home? You know, so yes, we are definitely looking at that, and our consultants have even been out riding our buses and actually, you know, seeing how it works, the way that it does, and you know, they're. Um, and then, you know, we say, you know, trying to stress the fact that this is just one part of looking at transportation, because then you also have infrastructure that goes with this, you know. So you might be able to put service down a street, but then you also have to look at, well, can people walk down the street to get to that service? You know, what's it like? So, so definitely the, the local factor is not being overlooked. We just want people to know that we know you don't just do everything within Lexington. So we want to make sure you also have a way to connect to other things as well. Right, but if you can't connect in Lexington, you actually can't connect anywhere else. Right, no, so it is right. definitely being looked at. Trust me on that, yeah. <laughs> um, 
In response to th this gentleman's question, I, I'm Elizabeth DeMille. Um, I might suggest that you, if you haven't already, looked at the Cross Town Connect experiment with Acton and Concord, which uses a basically GPS system. They use the existing vehicles, they connect Concord, Acton, Boxborough, I think Maynard's involved with this, and it's, um, they basically take people and transport them in COA van, council and aging vans or whatever, but it's been quite successful and it's getting people from their homes to that, that first mile. Thank you. That has been really interesting to look at and we did do that. In fact, before we even um, put out our RFP for a consultant, we brought in different people that we felt had a great range of experience. You know, so we brought in someone from the Metro West RTA, we brought in Crosstown Connect, um, and other folks and listen to them, you know, so we could get some ideas about what we wanted to put into our RFP and ultimately what we wanted to see come out of this project. So thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, so I'd just like to say thank you to our panel and thank you for everyone who came out and asked really uh, good pointed questions. So I really appreciate that. Um, and before you all go, if I could just take like five or 10 minutes of your time um, a couple other things. I forgot to mention that we we like a sign-up sheet by the door just so that we know who you are and who's coming to these first Fridays. So if you wouldn't mind signing in, we'd appreciate it. And then um, in preparation for our next month, first Friday, where you've already set it up, it's going to be on November 2nd here at the library as well in this room. Um, it is the question one ballot, uh, which is the patient to nurse limits. Donna Kelly Williams will present information from the yes side, and Anu Puri will present information from the no side. And just to let you know, a yes vote is a vote for establishing patient assignment limits for RNs working in hospitals. Limits would be determined by the respective type of medical unit or patient, and the maximum number of assigned patients would apply at all times. A no vote is a vote against establishing patient assignment limits. And like I said, if you would just allow me a few minutes to let you know um, what the uh, Massachusetts League um, is saying about these three, all three ballots. Um, we're only having a forum on the first question. So the LWVMA takes no stand on the first ballot question. This proposed law would limit how many patients could be assigned to each registered nurse in Massachusetts hospitals and certain other healthcare facilities. The maximum number of patients per registered nurse would vary by type of unit and level of care spelled out in detail in the question. The proposed law would require a covered facility to comply with the patient assignment limits without reducing its level of nursing, service, maintenance, clerical, professional, and other staff. The league stated goal for healthcare is an affordable healthcare system that provides equal access to quality healthcare for all. One side on this ballot question argues this measure provides for quality health care. The other side argues this measure would damage the health care system financially and make care unaffordable. LW, LWVMA's position could be interpreted to support both sides, and so they are not taking a stand on this question. Um, the other two questions uh, for the ballot. They are not take right. They are not taking a stand. So question two would create a commission to consider and recommend potential amendments to the United States Constitution to establish that corporations do not have the same constitutional rights as human beings and that campaign contributions and expenditures may be regulated. The LWVMA supports this question and urges a yes vote. The explanation is this proposed law would create a citizen's commission to consider and recommend potential amendments to the United States Constitution to establish that corporations do not have the same constitutional rights as human beings and that campaign contributions and expenditures may be regulated. Any resident of Massachusetts who is a United States citizen would be able to apply for appointment to the 15-member commission and members would serve without compensation. The commission's first report would be due December 31st, 2019. The National League position states that the league 
could support a constitutional amendment if it meets certain criteria. Therefore, studying the impact of the constitutional amendment, as this ballot question recommends, would be consistent with supporting an amendment only after careful consideration. Supporting this question does not commit the League to supporting any recommended amendment. And question three, would dismantle Massachusetts's Transgender Gender Identity Anti-Discrimination Act. That statute allows people to use the restrooms and locker rooms that match their gender identity and protects transgender people from discrimination in barbershops, malls, <coughs> restaurants, and other public accommodations. Repeals law prohibiting discrimination based on gender identity. The LWVMA supports and urges a yes vote on this question. This ballot question asks if, it asks if voters approve of the current law passed in 2016, which prohibits discrimination on the basis of gender identity in places of public accommodation. This current law protects the rights of transgender individuals. A yes vote is to keep the current law in place. A no vote is to repeal the law. The exact wording of the question is, quote, do you approve of a law summarized below, which was approved by the House of Representatives by a vote of 117 to 36 on July 7, 2016, and approved by the Senate by a voice vote on July 7, 2016? The League supports equal rights for all. Our goal is to secure equal rights and equal opportunity for all and to promote social and economic justice and the health and safety of all Americans. LWVMA has joined the Freedom for All Massachusetts Coalition in support of a yes vote for this question. So that was an awful lot, and I really appreciate you all allowing me to um, explain that and uh, give it all to you so that you can start to think about it, and please join us again here on November 2nd when we will be having the yes and no um, for the ballot one question. And again, thank you to our panel. Um, I appreciate your time and thank you everyone for coming.